Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Until There's a Cure Empowering Voices series. I'm here with special guest, Masonia. Thank you for being here today. Um, before we get started, I wanted to ask if it is okay if this interview is recorded. So is that okay with you? Yes, it's okay with me. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so I know you were born in Allentown, Pennsylvania, and then moved to Atlanta, where you were raised in Decatur, Georgia. So can you tell me a little bit about growing up in Atlanta and your hometown? So, yes, um, I know nothing about Allentown. I just know where it's located. Um, but I moved from New Jersey, well, from Pennsylvania to New Jersey to Virginia and then to Atlanta. And I got down here in uh, Atlanta when I was about four years old. I have been living here for over 25 years and a little bit about Decatur wasn't the best place in the metropolitan area to grow up, even though it was the suburbs. So yes, I was born in Allentown, Pennsylvania, and I grew up in Decatur, Georgia. And growing up in Decatur, it was the suburbs, but it was still part of metropolitan Atlanta. And as a kid, I was able to do things like ride my bike outside, rollerblade outside, double dutch, uh, run after the ice cream truck. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was able to do things like walk to the candy lady to buy candy up the street and hang out with my friends and do hopscotch. I had a pretty decent childhood, although some of the areas that I was in, they still had like, you know, a lot of gang activity and um, a lot of uh, crime happening, but I was in a pretty safe neighborhood, I would like to think, and I got to really enjoy just being a kid and, and hold on to those memories throughout my adulthood. Yeah, that must have been really nice. Yeah, I, I myself remember some of my childhood memories, like you said, chasing down the ice cream truck. Um, yeah, those are all playing with friends. All of that are wonderful memories to have once you grow up. Yeah. Um, do you have a specific favorite place? Favorite places. I really, when I think about it, there weren't really many places to go. I mean, you had, um, we had the world of Coca-Cola to visit as a child. Um, okay. You got to go visit Martin Luther King's home. So a lot of black mm -hmm. history was taught in my elementary schools and middle schools. It was definitely a high value, a thing to yeah. understand and learn about with the civil rights era being right here in the South. Um, Six Flags was a favorite to go to Six Flags over Georgia, Whitewater, and let me think. I really enjoyed Black history. So going visiting the museum for like Martin Luther King and the Civil Rights era, that was really cool. And seeing like Ebenezer Baptist Church and the home that he grew up in, um, those were definitely um, memorable moments for myself. Uh, visiting Stone Mountain, like just being able to walk to the very top of the mountain and see the entire city of Atlanta from the top. That was uh, something that I got to do. Uh, but in Decatur, really, we just played outside and just were kids. Uh, of course, we had a couple of video games, like the very first PlayStation that came out. Yeah. <laughs> but for the most part, it was just like just playing with my neighbors and my, my childhood friends. Okay, yeah, that must have been really nice. Thank you for sharing that. Um, okay, so I know you were a pharmacy technician for 10 years. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about what you did or why you chose to go specifically into pharmacy? Well, before I became a pharmacy technician, I was a waitress and a hostess and an expediter at Applebee's, but I needed more money and less time and for a job to be a little closer to my child's daycare and something that would be flexible for me to go back to college and finish school. So um, I had already had my associate's degree by the time I started working in the pharmacy. And my reason for working in the pharmacy really was just, I needed some flexibility and a job that would pay me well enough where I could go to school and work at the same time. And something that wouldn't be, um, as demanding as a waitress yeah. <laughs> working in the food industry. But yeah. my time as a pharmacy technician, I wasn't very passionate about it. 
as far mm-hmm. as just learning. It was really interesting to learn the medications and how they impact people. But as far as just wanting a full career in it, standing up all day that I wasn't really interested in. However, I really enjoyed um, helping people, helping people mm-hmm. by encouraging them that they're going to be okay when they have their medical uh, challenges uh, and diagnosis. Mm-hmm. I really enjoyed um, learning about the medications, breaking them down, compounding them, the science behind it, the chemistry behind it, I guess you could say. Those mm-hmm. are some things that I really enjoyed. Um, but being a pharmacy technician overall as a career was not something I decided. I wanted to do business. I wanted to work okay. in business and be the best at it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So um, I also know you, so is that the reason why you chose to do um, public policy as I think a major, um, if I'm correct? Well, yes. So I knew that I wanted to do business, right? And I was, yeah. I was pursuing my, my undergraduate degree in managerial sciences because I knew I wanted to do management. I knew that managers made a decent salary and I enjoyed like the idea of being a leader and doing the teamwork. And so while I was doing managerial sciences, I was taking a class that requires you to do Excel spreadsheets. Well, while taking that class, I got really bored. (laughs) (laughs) Little did I know, I probably should have stayed in it because you can make a lot of money doing spreadsheets. But even though I understood it, I got bored. So I went to a college fair and I came across a lady that told me um, about the different schools at at Georgia State University. And one of them was the School of Public Policy, which I didn't really understand at the time, but she was telling me about the nonprofit um, major that they had at the time. And she said a lot of people in the School of Business transfer to nonprofit and can keep all their credits. I said, oh, "Oh, that's what I want to do. Just went ahead and transferred my major over to the school and just kept going from there. Okay, that's perfect. So then everything ended up just working out with the nonprofit and just transferring your credits. Everything kind of fell into place. It did. It did. Unfortunately, um, I was diagnosed with HIV when I did the transfer. Okay. But then it turned around and worked in my favor because a lot of the projects that we had to do uh, was in public policy and um, social services. So because of that, a lot of the meetings that I was attending, uh, trying to understand what was happening in the community around HIV and AIDS, allowed me to mm-hmm. use it for my, my papers and my studies overall while yeah. in school. So it, it worked out where my genuine interests um, just intertwined with the studying that I was doing in school. I'm like, you know, a lot of people go to school and what their major is one thing. And then when they graduate, they do something different. I was yeah. actually, in my career while in school so wow, that's really out. cool yeah, yeah that's really rare that it happens a lot of people end up switching their majors two three times and still can't figure out what they want to do but um yeah that's really cool to hear thank you for sharing about that um so you wow. said that you concentrated in the nonprofit um area with the major in that so what were some of the nonprofits that you've worked with you mentioned i think um, working in like the HIV and AIDS area. So, um, have you worked with other nonprofits? Yeah, um, I have. Um, very briefly, I did, um, let's see, most of my work has definitely been uh, in HIV, like 98%. But I did okay. have one project in school where we had to go around and study different nonprofits and their fundraising abilities and their executive directors and how and interview them. And one of those nonprofits was uh, one that serviced refugees. And I couldn't help but think immediately, I wonder if these refugees are living with HIV. I wonder if they have access to services for people yeah. living with HIV. And if any of them do have it, you know, I wonder if their staff has any knowledge around HIV and AIDS. And so yeah. those are the things that immediately came to me. And of course, that definitely solidified my passion around HIV and AIDS. Like it just was an automatic thing, but learning um, how that nonprofit started how it expanded, 
um, internationally. I um, had an opportunity to volunteer with them, but um, other nonprofit organizations, it was more so around the intersectionality of HIV and AIDS. So from Sister Love Incorporated to the Positive Women's Network, to the Wealth Project, um, just about at least 10 organizations out of the 17 servicing organizations here in Atlanta that are aid service organizations. But most of the work that I've done have been with nonprofit organizations that are centered and focused around HIV and AIDS for women and youth and um, all genders. Okay, wow. That's really interesting because um, so then you've only, well, not only ever worked with H, um, nonprofits that focus on HIV and AIDS, but you're really passionate about it and you continue to kind of look for where kind of ends cross and meet. So that's really, um, that's really cool and interesting. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so you mentioned um, the Well Project. Can you talk a little bit about that? Oh, yeah. So um, where do you want me to start with, <laughs> with them? <laughs> um, um, let's see, how about, how did they, how do you know, talk, like maybe their goals and then how did this nonprofit come to be, if you know about that? They make sure that the latest information and research is accessible and available and that all aspects of HIV that is happening, that women are included around that. So from breastfeeding and HIV to aging and HIV, uh, long-term survivors, to uh, just making sure that our overall well-being is being addressed towards our needs because they do seem to be quite unique in comparison to those individuals who are not living with HIV and AIDS. Uh, it lessen, they help lessen the stigma and the burdens in which that we experience. Um, they uh, really do a beautiful job in lessening the trauma uh, experience around HIV and AIDS too for women of all ethnicities and races uh, and genders. So the way that I got involved with the Well Project, um, they have a blog, a global blog, where women living with HIV can share their lived experience on a continuous basis, not necessarily always discussing HIV, but just as a woman living with HIV, here are some experiences I'm having on my day-to-day -day life, mm -hmm. within my day-to-day -day life. And so uh, being able to meet some of their global ambassadors, I was able to really decide if I wanted to start blogging with them. I became a blogger. And after I became mm -hmm. a blogger with them, I started advocating and recruiting other bloggers. Mm -hmm. And then now I have become a community um, advisory board member uh, for the Well Project. And so I get to have a lot of, um, well, I get to ha have the opportunity, a lot of opportunities for my voice to be heard and mm -hmm. to be able to be a part of the policy changes that are happening, the research, mm -hmm. and to collaborate and partner with and build relationships with other women living with HIV. Um, for okay. encouragement and to lean on for support as well. Okay, well, so this organization is very supportive of women and youth living with HIV. Um, Absolutely. Which is amazing. Yeah, which is amazing. Um, because I feel like a lot of times people don't know that there's this kind of support, but there, there really is. And it's there for um, everyone. It may not be available to everyone, but it is definitely there. Right. Yep, it's available and they're working really hard around accessibility, making sure that um, women know that this organization exists and yeah. that their partners exist as well. So they collaborate and partner with a lot of other nonprofit organizations that uh, support women living with HIV and AIDS and they do a really, really beautiful job in ensuring that the communities are aware and that they know that the services are available. Yeah, that's wonderful. Um, what are some um, significant milestones that the Well Project has recently accomplished or that you're proud of mention? Um, well, one thing is the pandemic came and they held it down. <laughs> yeah. they, 
I'm really proud of the, the brave space that they've created. It's very safe. I feel safe yeah. all the time. They provide healing spaces all the time to um, really get you over the hump when you're experiencing some lows. Um, they do really, really great at uh, ensuring that the research is done as far as like surveying, what do women living with HIV need? What do they think? Um, based on their experiences, they make sure that the women living with HIV voices are heard as far as topics that typically don't get discussed from pregnancy and HIV to um, children being born HIV positive and growing up HIV positive to conversations around parenting, dating, as a woman living with HIV, they're really heavy on just ensuring that whatever needs um, are being vocalized, they address it. They never leave it on the table. I'm also really proud that their reach is beyond the U.S. The thing that I'm most proud of overall with the Well Project and, and praise them on is they are one of the greatest trailblazers in regards to how they uh, utilize trauma-informed care and the social economical approach of the involvement of people living with HIV and AIDS. And I really, really commend them on um, being a trailblazer in regards to how they partner with organizations and how they choose to collaborate with them as well. Well, yeah, that's a really important thing to have and having leaders and those kinds of organizations um, focus on different aspects of HIV that impact so many people is so important. You were also featured in um, a few magazines and you've been kind of on the spotlight and an advocate for several organizations. So um, how do you kind of deal with stress that comes with the work you do? And in what, day, in what ways do you have, take time for yourself to gather? Because I, I imagine it can be sometimes quite difficult. Well, yes, in some ways, but I often I think that the passion sometimes supersede the actual feeling of work because the drive okay. is always there. So... Okay. Oftentimes, like when doing the magazines and things like that, those to me are just moments in time that get to carry on beyond me. So they don't last very long because it's just a photo. It's just a couple of hours and you talk, you do interviews like this, and then, you know, life goes on. You, I'm compartmentalizing it, I guess you could say. And once yeah. they pack up and they leave, it's back to mommy mode. I got to go to school and do schoolwork, or I have to go pick up my kids. And then it's that thing that's being done. But the time management piece and using an agenda planner, those were things that really, 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 really helped me um, prioritize my needs by the hour. <laughs> yeah. because at one point I was doing things so much that I had it down to uh, the hour I, like what was I doing that next hour and um prioritizing my time was really a huge help for me around that and then the stressors just ensuring that I created a support system vocalizing my needs and, and the things that I want and need um, and the things that I do not need and the things I do not deserve or do not appreciate, I would make sure that I vocalize those things and didn't hold my tongue on that either. But mm -hmm. uh, even to my children, I made sure I vocalized, hey, mommy has this, this, and this going on. So I need you to pick up the ball on this, this, and this and ensure it's done by this day, this time, and in this way. So just making sure that I um, delegate a lot of my responsibilities, a lot of the needs, a lot of the wants <laughs> and just try my best to ensure that it gets done. But a lot of it had to do with time management and prioritizing what I deserve and what I needed at the same time. So although it has been hard and challenging, a lot of it was centered around what my next goal was, how long it would take to do it. And um, basically like making them smart goals. I really, uh, worked on making my goals smart, specific, measurable, attainable, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, uh, realistic and, and time measurable. I really, really incorporated that in my day-to-day -day life to make sure that I could accomplish the things that I needed to accomplish without 
falling apart. And then the moments where I did get overwhelmed, I just had to take a rest and sit still mm -hmm. and um, say no. Definitely yeah. saying no and practicing saying no. Even yeah. when I could say yes, I just would say no. I'm not available. No, I can't do it. And then yeah. if it's really meant for me, I will come back and say, well, actually I can do it. But mm -hmm. my initial response is no until I can say absolutely yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. That's starting to hear. It seems like organization and time management really came into play with all the work you've been doing. Um, but I am, as you said, having that passion and drive to do something, I feel just makes everything much easier. So um, that's really important and not everybody, not everyone has that. So that's really amazing. Um, so in regards to, um, uh, sorry, speaking up for HIV and all of that, why did you become, why did you choose to become an activist and speak and become like the face of certain nonprofits or organizations or even events and, and talk about your experience? So why did you choose to do that? So the reason why I started uh, sharing my HIV experience uh, was because I had a friend who transitioned or passed away or died from complications of AIDS that I went to high school with. And being so young, only out of school for about six or seven years, I didn't really understand how could he have passed away. And learning that he identified as someone a part of the LGBTQ community, I think that a lot of those individuals look at HIV as just a part of their lifestyle, a part of their demise, and I don't think that's okay. So one of the things that I felt really guilty about was if only he knew that he wasn't alone, that someone heterosexual, cisgender, um, African-American female, his friend, someone that we went to school with, not very close, but still considered a friend, um, mm -hmm. was not only living with HIV, HIV, but also pregnant, I think that he may have still been alive and, and felt like, okay, I'm not by myself, it's worth fighting for, and would not have given up. And so I decided to speak up. I, and then once I realized that, you know, the only thing that really put me at a higher risk was one, not knowing my partner's HIV status. Although once I got tested and had been with the same person, I thought that as long as I'm negative and my test results are coming back negative, the person that I'm with must be on a winning streak and also must be negative too. But that's not necessarily always the case. So you need to see your partner's um, test, not just hear about it. So yeah. during that time, I just really realized that where I lived put me at a high risk. So where I lived is where I'm gonna meet people that I can date and hang out with and get to know. Um, but there was a high prevalence rate of uh, newly reported HIV infections that I was completely unaware of. And so I just decided like, this is so unfair. This knowledge is here, this education is here and we barely have any awareness. All we have is testing happening. We don't have a lot of HIV awareness. And they said, well, nobody's really speaking up about it. Do you want to? And I just kind of took on that ball in, in the area that I live in. I did not aspire to be the phase. I just wanted to be a phase. There are a lot of emotions that have to deal with. And the mental side of it, um, just having to overcome uh, the, the fears and the shame, um, the guilt, the stigma, the uncertainty around an HIV diagnosis, I really didn't want other people to experience that. So I figured if I would speak up about it, if we would talk about it more, um, that would be helpful. And then also I didn't want anyone to make me feel less than, like to make me feel uncomfortable or inferior to who I was living with an HIV diagnosis. So I felt that if I would speak up about it, you would have to learn to respect who I am, what I'm doing and how I'm living, whether you agreed with it or not, that I still had rights as a human being to just live my life freely as I wanted to with or without an HIV diagnosis. 
So that's kind of how I started. I started because a friend passed away and that my neighborhood was showing high rates of newly reported HIV infections and well, HIV transmissions and that there has to be other people living with HIV that look like me, that are women, that identify as a female and you know, are struggling as a um, parent uh, that are African-American and just quiet and silent and, and not really getting the support that they deserve and need. So why not? Why not speak up about it? Yeah, definitely. I think the um, part you played in and not just like the scientific version of the scientific aspect of HIV of testing and um, providing the um, education and all of that. I think the support and um, giving those other aspects of the stigma and all of that, I think it's just as important and it can really help a person um, go through and really help them understand what they're going through, especially if they feel like they have someone else there with them. And like, as you said, being that um, support is just, I feel very important in, in the community. So how do you think, um, we can educate the next generation about HIV and its importance? Start them a little young. I think that destigmatizing HIV is a huge part of the education that needs to happen. And just from experience of speaking to hundreds of thousands of young people, people under the age of 18, not just the ones that they identify 18 to 24 as youth, but those under the age of 18, helping them to understand HIV, that it's around them, that um, it is a unique experience in some ways as a chronic illness, but it should be respected and not um, looked down or frowned upon to be shamed. Uh, I think that teaching it from a hygiene perspective, um, which I've experienced has been um, helpful I think that they should do that more. They should change what's being said in the school books. I think that helping people, helping young people to understand sex as a valuable thing and not just something that just is fluid as it can be uh, mm -hmm. could help a lot. Um, the worthiness behind it and understanding that if you want to date someone living with HIV, what the risk factors are, not that it's something that cannot be done, that something should be frowned upon. I do believe that all STDs uh, should be taught from a value perspective rather than just something you should fear that happens to just be out there. I think hygiene and sex should be taught more. Uh, there are a lot of venereal diseases that are communicable diseases that can be transmitted sexually that doesn't have to be if our hygiene was a bit stronger. Um, yeah. And uh, being taught around sexual partners from not just if you're with multiple people at the same time and you're just out here having sex with six, seven, eight to 10 people in one week versus six to seven to 10 people over your lifespan as something different. I think that understanding that no matter what, it only takes one time and you're at risk no matter what yeah. um, could help. But really truly understanding that people living with HIV are here and it hasn't gone away. It's been over 40 years. We look forward to it going away, but it really takes owning the value of preventing HIV overall to really fully get to what we say zero. Yeah. Yeah. That was a lot. <laughs> <laughs> no, no worries. Yeah, no, I definitely agree. I think that if we start young, if we start um, teaching young kids at an earlier age, um, not just about briefly what HIV is and how it can be transmitted and that's it, but that there are actual people living with this because they don't really teach us that at school. I remember taking a um, sex ed course and they talked for HIV and AIDS maybe one minute or two minutes and that was it. And then I never heard about it again. 
until I started working with Until There's a Cure. So it's really something that um, the community or maybe my community specifically doesn't really highlight on almost at all. So for the next generation, I realized that um, even for my children, they don't talk about HIV in school. He said it went, they went over it uh, very briefly in science and yeah. 10 minutes and that's it. But I think that the teachers are very uncomfortable about talking about it. I think that the parents are uncomfortable talking about it, but we have to acknowledge that the parents are living with HIV. The teachers are living with HIV and AIDS. And so are the students. The students too are still living with HIV and AIDS and they deserve to have the education amongst their peers so that they don't feel inferior and they feel supported and they feel acknowledged and, and not just be feared, you know, because mm -hmm. I think that the way HIV education is taught or AIDS awareness and AIDS education is taught is just to inflict fear. And I think that there's so much more that comes with it around accountability, responsibility, um, love, compassion, uh, those things really, really, really uh, leaves a heavier impression on the decisions people make around their sexual health. Yeah, and it definitely. starts is more impressionable and it sticks longer when you're younger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it it does. Um, I think it would be extremely helpful if um more, if this was like a taught not course specifically, but just taking more time to teach about HIV and AIDS and specifically how to teach it because not everyone, as you said, teachers and um, staff sometimes aren't feel, don't feel comfortable enough. And sometimes those teachers and staff are those that are living with an HIV and AIDS diagnosis. I think people count that part out when they talk about HIV. I think that people don't keep in mind because HIV is so secret. It's such a hush-hush thing. It's such a taboo thing to discuss and talk about the frequency of it because people living with HIV are just living their life, right? However, yeah. stigma comes in because people are feeling like it's so far away from them that it's not as close to home that when they discuss it, they forget that, oh, my cousin might have it. My cousin may have been born with it. And I never thought about it. They never talked about it. So why would I think about it? Yeah. So that's yeah. where the, the empathy or the mindfulness around it comes into play. So, um, you know, we have uh, recently the baby mentioning HIV, right, in such a negative yeah. way. However, as a rapper, he doesn't know that his drummer, he doesn't know that his DJ, he doesn't know yeah. if his uh, tour bus driver or mm -hmm. uh, his entourage <laughs> or anybody yeah. um, that's a producer uh, that's working on his team could be living with HIV, right? Everyone is impacted by HIV. No one is living with an HIV diagnosis. Someone somewhere, even if it's a coworker or a colleague, somebody is impacted by HIV in your life, whether you know it or not. It is, you know, a moment of, you know, ignorance is bliss. You don't know that this person could be near or around you. So why would you have to think about it? You know, you're in a happy state and, you know, that it doesn't exist because it's not in my world, but it's there. You're just not mindful of it. Yeah, exactly. I, I love what you said about that, um, that people sometimes are living in bliss, as you said, and there's so many people around us, but some, it's just a topic that is not discussed at all. It's just one of those things. And it shouldn't be. I really think it shouldn't. It should be talked about a lot more and accepted. Um, so I wanted to finish this off with one last question. Um, so what is one of the greatest gratifications you have felt working as an HIV and AIDS activist? So one of the greatest gratifications that I felt, I would say helping women to live, like being able to be a part of someone's journey, even, even the ones that have passed away, seeing that they went from a place of being terrified of continuing their lives 
to I am okay and I'm going to live this life. That shift brings me so much joy and to see them lean more into how they love themselves, how they stand up for themselves, how confident they become even more than they were before. I really embellish a relish in the joy of, um, of seeing that. I really, really take gratification and being a part of that small part of their journey. Like just to be able to witness that. I, I really enjoy giving the God that I serve praise and being a part of that. And just knowing that people go from, I'm not okay to, I'm okay with not being okay to, oh girl, I'm great. Yeah. <laughs> I'm doing real good. Yeah. <laughs> I'm doing real good. Matter of fact, how you need me to pour into you now? Mm. I really enjoy that. That right there is so fulfilling to me to see yeah. people want to live when they felt like they, or when they were going through their deaths in different capacities. So, yeah. you know, I've had, like I said before, I've had friends or peers um, to have passed away, but even being a part of their journey from, uh, I had a one friend who was uh, born positive, and when she found out she was pregnant, she cried and cried and cried and said, well, Sonny, what if this baby comes out positive? What if this baby mm-hmm. comes out living with HIV? I don't want this baby to go through what I went through. I was born positive. I don't want her going through that. And I said, well, if she was to be born positive, she would have a mother to help her navigate getting through that. And just to see her transition from understanding and respecting herself, feeling whole again, from broken to whole, you know, I, I really, really am so grateful that I've been blessed to be in so many people's lives to help them grow into feeling whole again. Yeah, I think I think that feeling um, is just demonstrating that all the effort and work not only you are putting into, but everyone else that is um, supportive of the HIV and AIDS community and um, everything about it is just extremely worth it. And it's so valuable to so many people, especially women, as you said. Um, okay, so thank you so much, Ms. Sonia, for this interview. It has been a pleasure to talk to you and learn a lot more about your life and activism and HIV, which is such an important topic and very relevant. Um, so thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you so much for interviewing me. And you're so sweet. I look forward to um, getting to know you more. And I wish you well on your future endeavors. Thank you.